Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, presentation by our interns on their projects. Uh, this time we have been very fortunate to have very good interns and fellows. We have had three batches of interns, one IIT Bombay, IIT Kharagpur, and also University of Mumbai and MIT. Uh, sorry, VIT in Pune, and uh, there is next batch which is not included today from IIT Delhi, and there is another batch from IIT Hyderabad. So all of them are doing very interesting projects, and what we are happy about is that it is a continuation of certain projects that we have been progressing for the underwater domain awareness or the digital ocean construct, as we call it, uh, touching upon diverse aspects to populate the underwater domain awareness framework. There is technology, there is <clears throat> uh, policy, and also there is capacity building. And this time we are happy to also report that we have a intern from Sri Lanka. Although Sri Lanka is going through a very difficult time, but uh, we are very happy to have this uh, young uh, <clears throat> professional from Sri Lanka. Uh, his name is Harish Sagar. And he is an, a student of international relation and he has done a very good uh, start of a project where he is looking at the underwater domain awareness framework for an Indo Sri Lankan, uh, how to further the Indo Sri Lankan relation. I mean, there is already a lot of warmth in the Indo Sri Lankan relation, but uh, I think with the involvement of local uh, youngsters, I think it is a very good uh, opportunity for us to show our solidarity with Sri Lanka. I was in Sri Lanka some time back and I have made some very good connections there and I, it is just a result of that connection that we could build up there. Uh, not taking much time, I will hand over to Sridhar who uh, actually handles our backend project and all research uh, and operations activity. Uh, and then I will request uh, all the interns to come one by one as per their turn and uh, make their presentation. Uh, Shridhar, this is all yours. Please unmute yourself, Shridhar. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, a very, very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Shridhar Programman. As I mentioned, this time we have had a very diverse set of uh, interns who have been working in different projects of AUV design and development as well as APY analysis. And also we have made significant efforts into taking forward the work that we had established, but what that work that was established by the past interns. Uh, every year we have a regular structure of how we follow the internship program where it, uh, the interns contribute to a research node followed by uh, a flow chart, a diagram of how they're going to, how their work is going to progress and then followed by an article that is contributed to our own UDA Digest, uh, and then uh, at the end, a project and the presentation of the same. So this presentation hopefully will cover the entire work that the research uh, that the interns have done over the period of eight weeks, uh, what new, what new uh, contributions that they are making to that particular project, and what are the new findings they have, uh, and they'll be trying their best to produce the same in front of you uh, for you to uh, look at. And, we wish the best for them in the future as well. Thank you. Uh, Atsaba, over to you. We can start. Thank you, Sridhar, sir. Uh, could you just, uh, I'll share my screen and I hope you can hear me properly. Yes, you can. Yeah, but the voice is clear, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the full screen properly. Could you just check that for me? Yes, we can. Right. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. I am Atharva Nagarkar from Vishwakarma Institute of Technology, Pune. And I've been working on this project, which you can see noise and vibration onboard marine platforms for underwater radiated noise, URN management. So, this is a continuation of a past work which has been done at MRC. So let's get started. So today uh, we'll be looking at all these uh, points in brief. So first we'll start with the problem statement, then the methodology followed. We'll have a quick look at why these studies are important, 
what are the different sources which are considered the transfer path analysis and uh, look at uh, the individual duct components and what uh, work I've done. So we'll look at that in the brief. So uh, initially the problem statement uh, involves basically about measuring and monitoring uh, the noise and vibration levels on board marine vessels and creating a tool for it, wherein the subset of this point becomes a transfer path analysis uh, subject that is the duct bond path, which is where the major focus of this project lies in. So uh, the methodology followed, uh, we can see, so we have followed two paths. The first one is uh, the theoretical part wherein uh, the guidelines which are established by various classification societies such as American Bureau of Shipping, Bureau of Veritas, Lloyd's Register, etc. So all these guidelines are combined into a software in a Python package and a theoretical attenuation is calculated. The other method followed is about a harmonic acoustic model is developed in ANSYS software wherein a CAD model is developed, meshing and boundary conditions are applied and the acoustic model is solved to get the output. Now the output of both these methods is a sound pressure level for a set of frequencies and we have to validate the harmonic acoustic model with the help of this theoretical uh, foundation so that we can establish the error of this. So this is the methodology followed. Next, uh, so why is the need for this research area? And these are the four important points. First is the crew habitability and human comfort, wherein we know that excessive noise is harmful to passengers as well as crew uh, on board. And we need to uh, make sure that it is within limits. Second is the failure analysis, wherein uh, there is a resonance happening between the natural frequency and the working frequency of different machineries on board. And so fatigue, failure, resonance, etc. These kind of occurrences need to be uh, omitted so that it does not result in failure of the ship. Next one is the stealth requirements. I think this is quite self-satisfactory uh, wherein there are a lot of requirements, especially in naval applications, wherein the stealth and the noise uh, radiated by the ship needs to be limited to a certain value. And last one is the underwater radiated noise or URN, which I'll refer uh, after this. So you are, it is extremely important that we reduce the noise which is transmitted from the ship or the hull structure to the uh, environment because it affects the aquatic life, the marine life, and uh, it creates a whole lot of problems. So it is important that we minimize this. So these are different sources considered. Uh, so wherein uh, there is some torsional vibrations between some connections of engine shafts, there are some uh, periodic thrusts or the actual vibrations are generated, some lateral or transverse uh, because of whirling of shafts. There are some gas pressure forces in the engine cylinders. There are some inertia because of the high masses of these rotating parts. There are some cavitation uh, vibrations wherein the bubbles implode on the surface of the propeller. There are some vertical pressure forces which are developed on the stern. And there's some special case uh, called a superstructure forward and aft vibration. So all of these are considered uh, in the project. Next is the transmission or transfer path analysis. You can refer it in both ways. So basically this project is based on a source path receiver model. So we follow the sources of lights through a transmission path into a receiver room. And so these are the four different methods which uh, you can see. So out of these, the fluid bond is the negligible one for our cases. Air bond and structure bond have been heavily researched at past interns at MRC. And that is why I'll be focusing on the duct bond path of it. So let's get started on the duct bond path. So the duct uh, components or the duct subsystem in most cases has these six main uh, components wherein it starts with a straight duct attenuation, the branching of uh, ducts, turns, end reflections, plenums, and silencers. So the method, so we'll first look at the geometries, then we created meshings, then inputs or acoustic sources are provided, some boundary conditions are mentioned, and then we'll evaluate the results. So <clears throat> let's just start with the first part, geometry and meshing. So as you can see, a mixture of TET or HEX geometry has been used and auto geometry has been used considering there are some uh, product license uh, limitations and other parts. So uh, uh, the best possible or the optimum type of mesh is uh, achieved. So the inputs given are analysis settings where we define the frequency. So we have used one, one or one third octave band frequencies. Then the acoustics region and the physics region are specified so that we get the acoustics and structural part of the simulation. A mass source is applied to simulate all these uh, vibration sources uh, inside the duct. A radiation boundary or also known as a Robin condition is applied wherein we make sure that whatever noise or vibration takes place, they remain inside the duct channel. 
so that is the use of this boundary condition and finally absorption surface because we know as sound uh, travels uh, there is an absorption on the inner part of the duct walls and some attenuation takes place and in the solution part you can see sound pressure level where we evaluate the results so this is the first component of the duct a straight duct system wherein uh, a simulation is done so in the graph you can see uh, we'll first focus on all the frequencies above 500 hertz you can see a constant line is there as given by the empirical relation as well as the simulation model for low frequencies, especially around 31.5 and 63 hertz we have some issues and that is because the simulation needs for this special case needs to be carried out via a low frequency model which is a special part of this ANSYS software. Unfortunately, because of some product uh, licensing issues, uh, we are not able to simulate that part. But apart from those first one or two frequencies, you can see that the theoretical and simulation results are very much in accordance with each other. Next is the turn. So when the, there's a turning of a duct, the major attenuation cause is when the sound energy hits the inner lines, inner walls of the duct surface. So that is why we get a graph. As you can see, again, the graph, the nature of the graph for both theoretical and simulation aspects are in very much in accordance. The difference in the two measured values or the calculated values is approximately one decibel at the maximum, and that is an acceptable value as per the major guidelines. The third one is the branching of duct wherein there is a division of sound energy as the we follow a transmission path of interest and there are multiple uh, ducts which originate from a certain point and so we follow one single path and we calculate the results. Now this branching of duct the empirical or the theoretical model on which it is based it is calculated specifically for high frequencies above 1000 hertz so only the frequencies equal to and above 1000 hertz are considered in the theoretical model and in the simulation model you can exactly see that we have a very good uh, accordance between these uh, values for uh, above 1000 hertz so below uh, 1000 hertz uh, the theoretical attenuation is generally negligible and is not considered and you can see that again this model has a very successful validation part next one uh, is the plenums so a plenum is basically an air distribution box uh, we can say uh, wherein there is an inlet of the air or the working fluid and then there is an outlet or it is supplied to many maybe multiple ducts or uh, uh, flows so here again uh, there are two ways in which we can uh, model a plenum we can say so uh, the parameter on which we decide how to model is the frequency of the sound which uh, is generated so if the cross-sectional area is comparable with the uh, wavelength of this uh, sound then uh, we have to follow a room kind of simulation and if it is not comparable we follow a muffler type of simulation so the muffler one is a low frequency simulation where there is a difference in wavelength the room one is a high frequency simulation where there is a comparison of wavelengths so in our case under consideration we have the high frequency case that is again above 1000 hertz and so you can see uh, these three points at 2000, 4000 and 8000 hertz, we get the noise values. Some issues uh, are there in the simulation of uh, this part as uh, there are some issues in the theoretical model as well. But uh, for general purposes and even scientific purposes, uh, the error which is involved <clears throat> in these parts is uh, acceptable. So even this case is something which we can consider as a good source of uh, information. The next one is. effect takes place so this effect takes place for certain frequencies below something called as the cutoff frequency this cutoff frequency for our case under consideration is around 400 hertz so we consider all the frequencies below cutoff frequency that is below 400 hertz that is why you can see in the graph the last frequency is 250 hertz in the octave band now what happens is that at higher frequencies the noise which comes out of this uh, end reflection it goes more like a piston or a beam and it does not uh, reflect back into the original duct this reflection of sound back into the original duct happens at low frequencies below that cutoff frequency and that is the cause of attenuation in end reflections and as you can see from the graph we get the values Last one is the silencer. So just to give a, you a reference, this is the assembly of a silencer wherein the, the green part you can see is the air channel. The orange one is the perforated metal plate and the gray one is the acoustic absorptive material so that the attenuation takes place because of uh, this absorptive material. 
So in the next image, you'll see this green part is only simulated. So this, these are the results of the silencer. So uh, as you can see, again, the nature of the graph for silencers are again very good. But there are certain errors which are uh, due to a uh, difference of meshing. If we can go with a finer mesh, then we can get the re desired results. So yeah, again, we can see that there is a good uh, there in sync. These two results of theoretical and simulated results. So these were the six duct subsystems which are common across any uh, duct components. So we can say that all of these are validated successfully. So to conclude, this uh, package which was developed in Python accurately represents the existing theories and we, we saw that the successful validation of this harmonic acoustic models means that this model can act as an additional source of information for designers and researchers. If we can improve this model by using finer meshes, better technology and maybe certain advanced uh, features of any software, then we'll get an even more accurate representation. But for general scientific purposes, uh, this uh, model is OK. And finally, uh, the, we have carried out this analysis uh, to minimize the underwater radiated noise. So since this uh, noise is transmitted via ducts to the hull structure and from there to the under to the environment, calculating and properly analyzing this noise will give us an exact idea of what uh, is the contribution of this type of transmission path analysis to the ultimate URN uh, noise. And so if we can reduce this by use of absorptive lining, some silencers, some uh, attenuation devices, then we can reduce the overall underwater radiated noise, which is transmitted to the environment and thus it will benefit all. Thank you. Sridhar, so back to you. If you have any questions, anyone, please, uh, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for your presentation. Now, I will request Sarita, ma'am, to come and take over. Good evening, everybody. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. My name is Sarita Tanwar and I am a PhD in biotechnology. I have completed my PhD from the University of Mumbai. I'm currently working as an intern with UDA MRC. The topic of my presentation is study of CV subspecies and their applications. The overview of this project would be to introduce what are CVs, their classification, their distribution, followed by the, their characteristics and applications and coming down to the research gaps where India is lacking and what improvisations can be done. Lastly, we will talk about the achievables and the accomplishments through this study. This is a work which was earlier conducted by Mr. Shlok Nemani and currently uh, myself, Mr. Prakash and Mr. Siddhant are working on this project. Now, what are CVs? CVs are primitive marine macrophytic organisms which grow in marine and shallow coastal waters and on rocky shores. These represent a considerable part of the ocean biomass. They are photosynthetic in nature and lag through roots, stems, and leaves. These also vary vastly in size, shape, and colors. They can be further classified according to, the, uh, according to their pigment present. For, uh, for uh, instance, red algae, the brown algae and the green algae. Now, India stands amongst the 12 mega biodiversity nations in the world with a coastline of approximately 8,100 kilometers long. From more than 25 to 30,000 seaweed species, around 844 have been identified and deposited in the repositories by India. These comprise of 434 red algae species, 216 of green algae, and 194 of brown algae species. Let's take a look at each of them. The brown algae, also known as Ocrophyta or Seophyceae class, these are commonly found in cold waters along the continental coast. However, they seem to be absent in the tropical waters. Their major pigment is fucoxanthin, which masks the green color of the chlorophyll. And they can range from dark brownish to olive green, and depending on the concentration of the fucoxanthin in them. 
the application wise these uh, were once a major source of iodine and potash however now they find applications in uh, baking uh, ice creams gelling agents and also are used as fertilizers moving on to the red algae also known as the rhodophyta these are predominantly marine algae they are often found attached to other shore plants their major pigment is phycoerythrin or phycocyanin which gives them their red color they are most important and major sources of agar they are also in high demand from industries all around the globe these are also used as a substitute for gelatin in pudding in ice creams and in toothpastes as well the last is the green algae or the chlorophyta group these are uh, usually found in the rocky shores and uh, of, of seas and oceans and some may also grow in brackish water in sludge and seepage wherein uh, uh, which is rich in organic matters the major pigment in them is um, the chlorophyll which gives them the typical green color these are its sources of vitamins a d and c and are used in salads and soups majorly let's take a look at the characteristics of seaweeds now seaweeds are beneficial to the ecosystem as they act as major natu uh, natural carbon uh, capturing sinks now they are sustainable renewable sources they are sustainable renewable sources of biofuels and fertilizers as well they are rich sources of proteins vitamins minerals dietary fibers and lipids they also produce some very powerful antioxidant compounds like fluorotannins carotenoids and sterols which has antibacterial antifungal anticancer and insecticidal activities as well the, the sulfated polysaccharides produced from seaweeds have shown potential in pharmacological applications as well the major uh, the other applications are uh, the food and the feed they can be used for human consumption as well as cattle consumption they are also used in uh, cosmetics pharmaceuticals nutraceuticals they are uh, used as uh, fertilizers biofuels as well as other industries like textile paints varnishes uh, etc the research gaps that we are going to deal with this uh, in this project are the, firstly the demand to supply gap Uh, although we have 46 industries which are producing uh, agar and agarus however there is still a major gap in the supply which we uh, need to understand now why uh, the understanding about the distribution patterns and the application of the seaweed species may help in uh, uh, may help in achieving this demand to supply gap also the significance of alterations in culturing parameters have a great effect on the yield and productivity of the seaweed all of these parameters if included uh, in a touch of uh, online data would be uh, very helpful for the research community for the industries as well as for the cultivators so the aims and objectives of this project according to these uh, keeping these uh, research gaps in the view were to enlist the numerous cv species and their distribution to understand the characteristics of different cv species and to carefully select the area for the cultivation and to analyze the appropriate cultivation methods it was also necessary to understand their potential application and the benefits that they provide to agriculture to domestic as well as industrial sectors lastly a tool that would be de developed could predict or provide real time data with comprehensive details about the seaweed of interest with respect to its productivity availability yield and applications the methodology part that is the culture the culture's uh, techniques and the cultivation methodology would be taken care of by mr prakash and finally the uh, responsibility of developing a tool was done by mr siddhant batra so the methodology was uh, suggested as to generate a seaweed uh, species list which would have all the details regarding its uh, nature the characteristics etc to understand their applications was another part and uh, to understand their cultivation met methodologies and modifications if required in the culturing techniques in order to get maximum yield production was also that uh, lastly the tool for comprehensive data and analysis was developed the results were uh, the information about the seaweed species was available and uh, the list a list of uh, a list was the details of significance and applications of each of the seaweed species was jotted down 
the, uh, the parameters for their opt optimal culturing and harvesting period as well as their yield and productivity were studied. An Excel sheet with all of this data in one place was prepared with the name and classification of the seaweed, their geographical distribution, their growth parameters, as well as their application. All of this data was then fed in the, in the, in the tool that was developed. We found some uh, commercially important species that were available in India and were in major demands. These are uh, six of them. This is a representation of the Excel sheet that is uh, being uh, that is uh, have been prepared with a list of around 30 species, and we intend to increase more with all our uh, knowledge and literature available and the research carried out. The accomplishments of this study gave us a comprehensive list of at the most all the seaweeds subspecies that are currently being uh, grown and uh, have uh, commercial importance. Uh, their characteristic and applications were studied. The effect of uh, on the yield of the particular seaweeds due to the alterations in the growth parameters was studied by Mr. Prakash and a predictive tool that would be beneficial to the cultivators, to the research community, to the industrialists was uh, prepared by Mr. Sidhan Batra. This would help us, this project would help us to gain more insights regarding the growth and the uh, yield of seaweeds. These are the references that I have been referring to. Thank you very much. Over to Prakash if there are no questions. Thank you so much, Sarita ma'am. I will request Prakash to come over and take it. Can you hear us? Yes. Am I audible? Hello? Am I clearly yes, audible? audible? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, very good afternoon to one and all present here. I am Prakash, yes. Um, I am currently doing my master's in aquacultural engineering from IIT Karakpur and a student uh, intern from a maritime research center. Currently, I am dealing with, as my colleague said, I am dealing with the study of identification of environmental parameters for the seaweed cultivation. So let's start how my work, my, how my work is gone and how, what are the things that we are going to learn. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, these are the aims and objectives of my study, like to study the what are the different environmental and hydrodynamic parameters for the required for the growth of the seaweed. Uh, it's not like some other plants. Uh, this is this is also a macroalgae which will belong to the plant. Uh, plant. So this requires some of the parameters that is not similar to other parameters. So what are the important thing? Let's just uh, look into it and what are the effects of it? So these are the contents that we are going to progress with the next uh, presentation what are the culture method common culture method that we are available following in india and why we should understand the growth parameters and what are the generalized ideal conditions that we are following while growing the C while to grow the cv and what are the spatial distribution that is available in india uh, as per the literature that we have found out and what are the literatures like what are the species available and what is the growth what is the optimum temperature and what is the salinity for this uh, thing we will look into it and what are the who are the, all the beneficiaries and the research gaps we will also look into it like and the followed by the conclusion next slide please so uh, these are the three main culture method that we are currently following in india the first method is the tube net method and the second one is bamboo raft method and the third one is the long line or monoline method we would call the first method will be useful for where we are having like a high uh, higher wave areas uh, generally in gujarat and andhra pradesh and the floating raft will be in uh, mild common conditions and long line method where we will use in the moderate conditions like in between the high and uh, low conditions we will use this long line or monoline method out of these three each method has its own unique specification where we can have this method this uh, generally we will follow bamboo raft method for uh, higher biomass e uh, coming to next slide please so 
the very most important thing the comes to our mind is anything that we need to grow we should understand what is the important thing that's required for its growth either in terms of uh, uh, like uh, its requirement re regarding to its uh, uh, either for example if we want to grow we have to take food right so uh, like that we need to understand if we want to grow the growth of the like uh, a cv we need to get into what are the parameters that we need to understand so site selection is the very most important thing uh, where we can have a suitable site cultivation in case of uh, this uh, commercial seaweed farming and this site selection plays an important role in the economic return for the farmers also and this uh, for good biomass production and for good economic return where oh, we are going to invest or for the entrepreneurs this should be a study then this basic understanding should be helpful for the farmers or entrepreneurs from getting failure from seaweed farming so that they won't be like uh, in a uh, more lost situation at the end of their farming conditions. The next slide, please. So these are the generalized growth parameters, which is been really required for the seaweed to grow. The first thing, very most important thing is the sea surface temperature. And the next is uh, salinity. The next is pH of the seawater and the light conditions, how much light conditions it require. This light condition is also depend upon the salinity and the turbidity of the water, um, silt conditions of the water and nutrient availability, water depth and wave current. These two are the hydrodynamic properties that is required for the good uh, seaweed growth. Coming to next slide, please. So uh, let us uh, move on to the various ideal concerns that we are generally following in India. Uh, the seawater should have uh, salinity, or should be more than 30 ppt, and uh, the bottom should be sandy or rocky so that uh, the seaweed can stick into it, like, and then it, it can grow. The ideal temperature should be between 26 to 30 degrees Celsius. And the area should have a minimum of one meter water depth, even during, even also during the low tide. And uh, area with mild water current is preferred so that the seaweed will not get uh, apart from the culture system. And uh, pH should be maintained in the range of 6.5 to 8.5. The nutrients, uh, that's whatever the site that we are selecting, it should have sufficient nitrate and nitro nitrate, nitrogen and phosphorus. Generally, the nitrogen level and phosphorus level should be in the range of 0.08 and 0.065 milligram per liter. And phosphate should be in the range of 0 0.017 to 0 0.074 milligram per liter. Next slide. So as I mentioned earlier about it is really important to identify what are the various site conditions that we need to uh, uh, site conditions we have chosen. Uh, based on the site condition, uh, as per the research done by CMFRI and from some groups from India, they have identified these are the following sites. Um, for example, if you take uh, Tamil Nadu, which has uh, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat, which has the long potential sites for the seaweed cultivation. In general, total India is having the special distribution of area 23,970 hectares of area where we can have seaweed cultivation. But I think we are not properly utilizing this uh, tech, uh, site, sites for the seaweed cultivation. Uh, next slide. So these are the various findings that we have found from the literature. These are the species, seaweed species and the temperature and the salinity that is uh, required for this optimum growth where we can have good uh, biomass yield if we maintain this temperature and salinity. And these are some of the findings. For example, if we take Capophagus halvarezi, which is a red algae, important commercial species of India, it grows in a good condition of temperature around 26 to 28 and the salinity should be in the range of 30 to 33 and floating cage method is preferred for its cultivation and uh, if you take a gracilaria dura which is also a red algae uh, 26 to 31 temperature is required 30 to 36 salinity and uh, this this as i mentioned earlier each species has its own unique specification to grow so based upon the finding that they have found polypropylene net method which is the best suitable uh, for its uh, High, high biomass yield, which is uh, similar to the tube net method also. And Gracilaria acerosa, uh, the temperature is 25 to 33, and the salinity can grow in, well in 28 to 38. Suspended stone method, where we can uh, tie the seed in the a stone uh, with a rope, uh, and then we will just suspend in the seawater, and then we will uh, heal the biomass after 45 to 60 days. That is the general cultivable seaweed uh, days. 
so uh, this is the this is how i studied go through the literature for example if i throw as i mentioned earlier the capapica salvaris uh, species so in the graph that we can clearly mention uh, we can see that uh, the long line method and flow, float line method what is the biomass yield that we are getting in each month and uh, the floating cage and the long line method what is the specific growth rate that is being observed from the gra uh, gra from the graph we can easily observe that floating cage method which is also called a bamboo raft method is giving a good biomass yield so based upon these kind of researches they have found out like what are the important species uh, important parameters and what is the important cultivation method so that within the particular stipulated time how much biomass yield can we can uh, absorb so this is the very most important thing uh, so if, when we get the high biomass yield the economic return will also be good right so uh, next slide please and uh, from the economic important species of India, these are the species which are still to be addressed from the uh, uh, addressed. So the further research has to be done on these species also so that we can make use of all those uh, spatial lands with uh, this information and with the research going on in this field, uh, we can be able to cultivate the species and this will optimum, uh, ultimately lead to the good economic return for India. Next slide. These are the various things that we need to address. Uh, the first thing is the innovation as uh, we need to have a good innovation in the seeding technology so that the wild species didn't get extinct. If the like innovation is being done, we should invest in the research work. As I mentioned earlier, we have, these are the species that we have, that has been left for the, like uh, that has to be researched on. So we have to do sufficient research so that uh, it will be useful for farmers, entrepreneurs and all. Suitable finance and uh, income should be like uh, uh, supported to the farmers who are entrepreneurs who is it to start about this project. And detailed marine spatial analysis has to be done to for the good side uh, seaweed cultivation. Next slide, please. These are the outcomes from my study. Uh, cultivation method and culturing parameters we have studied and the importance of maintaining parameters what are the parameters that we have to optimize it has to be maintained that we have analyzed and the data from this study will be uh, is, it is the foundation for creating a tool or a website where others can uh, utilize this information gather this information if they want to grow for the uh, grow the cv and uh, this tool is being um, will be useful for all entrepreneurs, farmers, and whatever the government agencies who is making some policies uh, in a better understanding uh, for the seaweed growth. Next slide. These are my various references from where I have taken all these data. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll hand over to Siddhant. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prakash, for your presentation. I will request Shivdan to come and take over. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sudhan Bhatra. Uh, I'm uh, an electrical engineering student at IIT Bombay. Today, I'll be talking about this APY analysis web tool we have developed. So these are the contents. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the need for such extensive research. And why do we need for this tool? Then uh, I will talk about why do we need a uh, website tool for this? Then uh, what I have currently implemented, the challenge phase, then uh, what can be further done in this project? And then I'll demonstrate the tool. Uh, need for research. Uh, before we even begin to talk about how having an impact on something of national importance, it is very important for you to have your homework done. So before we began to develop this project further, it was uh, important for us to have a good picture of the state of aquaculture in India to identify the gap in the marine farming industry. That is the knowledge required for a 
need uh, to have a sustainable marine farming culture in the country most of the farmers are rural and they do not have the perfect environment for marine species production be it temperature salinity identification of site of production or method of production or the seeds they are using to grow a particular species it is our aim through this project to cater to all these gaps it is also very important to identify the species or the subspecies which is best suited for the cultivation based on the indian climate demand on the market usage value or so as to ensure that we have we are maximizing our output towards the benefit of the people of this country and also to take care of the international demands to increase the contribution of blue economy towards the economy of the country all the stakeholders must understand that right now it is needed to do research in aquaculture domain it is important because it is essential to gather as much data as possible on it right now we are focusing on identification of species and favorable conditions for the production but we must also expand the domain to disease management and improving the feed and the seed quality as well uh, moving on the great advantage of having a website for apy analysis uh, tool is that it allows us to impart information to every corner of the world with concentrated relevant and updated content its address never changes and it's most it's the most reliable source of information exchange compared to other forms of media a leisure advantage of this website is that it provides faster navigation between the pieces of information also it is easy to add content and allows to show more information or update the existing one hassle free more content can be aggregated at any time and stored with the uh, world immediately current implementations about the current implementation we have uh, currently implemented uh, the apy analysis tool for several species uh, which predicts the growth rate of and yield of up to seven seaweed species which also tells us if it's optimal for production or not at the farming site it also tells us about the sites of production uh, currently in india and the applications and uh, use cases of these species in india we have also implemented the blog pages to display info about several government policies and technologies of importance in the underwater domain then a feedback page has been implemented for the users to raise any queries or any discrepancies or if or just if they wanted to co contribute so that they can uh, contact the mrc team this project has been completed using python programming language specifically its django framework and uh, the front end has been uh, developed using html and css uh, challenges face Uh, the major challenge we faced while completing this project was lack of data available in regards to the growth rate uh, against the growth parameters, which is very important uh, for devising the mathematical models which predict the yield at a particular uh, farm site. To overcome this, we had to make a lot of approximations, but finally we were able to achieve high accuracy. another noteworthy thing i noticed while working on this project is that there is a lack of research at, within the country and all though people have started to realize this it requires more focus a uh, further development in this project uh, would be to add more species of uh, seaweeds currently we have seven but we are planning to add uh, about 10 more this is not uh, limited to seaweed only uh, species other than seaweed such as uh, shrimps uh, and tunas uh, etc which are uh, of commercial importance must also be added then uh, once the uh, research uh, has been uh, done uh, regarding these species then a database can be developed in this website's backend using sqlite uh, then uh,
after working on this uh, project i understand that the uh, yield in india is not uh, uh, much and it can be increased a lot so uh, we must uh, focus on uh, devising methods of production by technology and uh, policy implementation to boost the uh, yield uh these are some glimpses from the tool we developed on the left uh, we have the uh, uh the front of the uh, tool where we enter the farm parameters currently uh, uh, there are six parameters in this you can see on the right uh, there is a, a blog page then here uh, on the left we have the results page which uh, i'll be demonstrating and uh, on the right we have the seven species that we have added till now okay uh, now i'll demonstrate it okay so uh, this is the blog page we discussed about uh, this contains about the various policies uh, by the government with pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana and it also contains the methods of production currently in use that is the srfr method the tube net method mole line method uh etc uh we keep on adding uh more methods and policies and uh, data as and when we get it uh i'll go to the okay uh so here uh firstly i'll uh, show you the our uh, species uh this species grassleria crassa is uh, in production in tamil nadu uh that uh, temperature for this is around 25 then this is if the uh, the production increases with the light intensity up to uh, 100 uh, so let's put 80 then uh, we know that uh, the optimal ph is around 8 so 8 uh, nitrate concentration should be somewhere between 18 to uh, 75 ppb so uh, okay um, then phosphates should be around uh, from 1.7 to uh, 7.5 ppb so let's put 4.5 okay okay uh, so as you can see the results page uh, shows the species and the concentration it uh, uh, lists down the parameters we inputted then it uh, from the math mathematical model we developed it uh, predicts if uh, the farming site is optimal for production or not uh, the it also tells the estimated growth rate per day that is currently 5.79 uh, uh the uh, according to the research done in india uh, we have achieved a growth rate of about 5.9% so it is pretty close uh then it uh, displays the uh areas in india where the species is uh, cultivated currently we just have tamil nadu mandapan area then it uh, displays the industrial applications uh, of the production i show you one more species uh dasilaria idealis uh this species is in cultivation in uh, lakshadweep and andaman and nicobar islands and some parts of tamil nadu Uh, so let's put twenty. Ninety. It should be eight. Forty-one. Then it should be four point five. Okay. Ah. Uh, I mean. yeah uh, so as you can see the optim actually the optimum temperature for this species is around 30 degree celsius and uh, we have uh, uh, inputted 25 degree celsius that is why the uh, current growth rate is uh, less in the labs we have achieved a growth rate of 13.7% uh, for this species but uh, currently in the coastal waters in the indian ocean region uh, in india uh we are getting uh, the maximum growth rate of about uh, 6% uh, during the month of november and december so as you can see it's uh, 
uh, cultivated in parts of Tamil Nadu and uh, Lakshadweep and Andaman Nicobar Islands. Then it is used for preparing agar, uh, jelly, paisan, in food and uh, pickle. Now I'll also uh, give you an example where uh, this too doesn't work. So we don't want it to work here. Right? So we can uh, put in any parameters. I'm just putting in random numbers. Uh, we see since the uh, parameters inputted are uh, very out of range, uh, that is why we are getting that the farm site is not optimal for production and the estimated growth could be, rate would be 0.0%. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sadran. Now I would request the AUV team, Harsh, to come and take over. Good evening, all of you. Am audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Greeting all of you, uh, myself, Harsh Kumar, and I'm a BTEC student at IIT Bombay in the chemical engineering department. And I will be giving, I will be giving an overview of uh, the intern project I have taken up that is autonomous underwater vehicle. And I have uh, taken up this office subsystem. So to begin with, uh, like what is this project all about? So the project aims to validate a 3D spatial temporal graph of low frequency ambient noise using an autonomous underwater vehicle that is an EUV. So while we are de developing the first prototype, Mark 1, uh, we aim to carry out the mission at a depth of around 20 meters. Uh, and the pattern that we are following, the search pattern, uh, we stimulated it using Ross and Gazebo to check that if the uh, accuracy of the search pattern was optimal enough to carry out the mission. Uh, before I begin to explain the project, I'll uh, do a very quick overview of what ambient noise is and why do we even care to validate it. So underwater ambient noise is anything except the self noise, excluding forms of uh, uh, electrical noise or marine noise. So we can see here in this uh, photograph that uh, marine animals, ships, climatic uh, changes, all are causing different type of noises. So Apart from all these noises, the noise that is there underwater is called the ambient noise. So the question is why work on validating ambient noise? So actually the validation of the spatial temporal uh, low frequency noise helps us in uh, various domains, including military and non-military applications. Uh, whether we talk about maritime security, blue economy, environment regulators, uh, we have a great application of them. Moreover, when we talk about signal to noise ratio, that is a very important ratio when we talk about marine instruments. It is of prime importance there. Also, to detect signals such as sounds of submarine or eco ground targets, uh, we need to have a map of the ambient noise uh, beforehand so that we can uh, check and validate stuff much better. Now, to the roadmap, roadmap to the project. First of all, I'll cover the previous work at MRC. Then I'll go over the navigation subsystem, the control subsystem the stimulation that we have done and the future work. So first of all, the previous work at MRC, uh, as Sir Isaac Newton had said that I see much farther standing on the shoulder of giants. So we were fortunate enough to have uh, some extensive research work done at MRC before our project. So uh, Sridhar Sir had worked on low frequency ambient noise mapping and he has done some excellent work uh, for noise mapping in the Indian Ocean region. Also, we had Sarthak Raj, uh, one of the former interns at MRC and currently a research fellow. Uh, he had also done some uh, great work and detailed description of AU design and development for noise validation was documented by him. So we had built up on uh, built upon all the available resources and moved further in the in in this domain. Now I'll move on to the navigation subsystem. When we talk about the navigation subsystem. It is the very A of the AUV. It is the autonomy. So when we define a navigation subsystem, it is very important to take care of four parameters. First is position estimation. 
we need to have an idea of where the AOV currently is underwater, uh, so that we can estimate that how it is going to move, whether it's uh, validating the data correctly or not, or whether the machine is being uh, processed correctly. Next is optical avoidance. Like uh, when we go underwater, there are a lot of obstacles that may come in front of us, like marine animals or some other AUV or anything else. So we need to take care of that and avoid them. Then there is the upon guidance and prognostic based mission planning. Uh, mission plan. We'll be, cov uh, be covering them uh, in detail as we go on further. But for prognostic mission based mission plan, we say that we are just um, making the plan, keeping in mind that what type of mission we have. So when we talk about the navigation subsystem, there are three major types of navigation uh, methods that are being used. First is the inertial or dead reckon uh, method. So we use accelerometers and gyroscopes for increased accuracy, uh, and we check the movement of AUV using uh, these sensors. But uh, a very common problem with them is that we face uh, position uh, position error growth that uh, that is caused due to the uh, ocean drift. So as you can see in this image, uh, by the accelerometers, we uh, estimate the AUV to move in the very forward direction, but its actual trajectory is a bit a lot different, and that is due to the fact that ocean current is uh, moving towards the right. So uh, this error keeps on growing as we move on further and further. So this is a natural problem uh, with this uh, uh, type of navigation, and uh, that's why we have to use a DVL sonar that can measure the speed of the seafloor relative to the AUV. So this helps us avoid this error, and then this method can be used efficiently. Uh, we can also use this method using geophysical navigation combining with it. Uh, I will cover it uh, in the third point. Next, we have the acoustic navigation. So this is one of the most traditional methods that we use underwater because underwater electromagnetic radiations or other type of emissions do not propagate properly. Acoustic navigation works uh, really well. So what we basically do is we send uh, signals from the UV uh, and they collide with the optical in front and uh, the signal comes back. So we uh, map the difference in time between the signal being sent and being received back. Uh, that is the uh, that is, is the main base used to measure the distance between the AUV and the obstacle. Uh, we have two main methods that being long baseline LBL and ultra short baseline. In long baseline, we use uh, two beacons, and for ultra short baseline, uh, we use a beacon at the base uh, and creating a geophysical map of it. Thirdly, we have the geophysical navigation. So it is one of the methods that actually creates a sort of GPS for the ocean um, domain. We use a magnetic field or gravitational field to actually map out the entire uh, area. And then we can very uh, precisely pinpoint the location of the AUV by measuring the gravitational and magnetic field at that very point. So that's why when we combine geophysical navigation with inertial dead reckoning uh, method, then we get a good estimate uh, of uh, where the AUV currently is. So these are the, some of the images like uh, sites on ours being used for acoustic navigation and geophysical navigation uh, in process. Now we'll uh, talk about some search patterns. Uh, when we uh, when we move forward to make an AUV, it is very important to look for some very basic and common methods also. Because uh, when we talk about navigation uh, methods like acoustic navigation or geophysical navigation, we're using sensors, and sensors require uh, some computation power and some uh, power from the batteries. So to avoid that, we can also follow some search patterns. So we studied some search patterns, and these three uh, were the patterns commonly followed. First was a spiral pattern. It is the most common pattern that we follow for a single sweep search. When the whole area needs to be completely covered in minimum amount of time, uh, this is the traditional uh, spiral pattern that we are all familiar with. Next, we have the lawnmower method. Uh, it is uh, one of the uh, popular methods that uh, all um, basic AUVs use. Uh, in a lawnmower method, we uh, move uh, straight and then we take a 180 degree turn at the end. Uh, we need to take care of how many turns we take and um, that will decide that how efficiently are we mapping the entire area. So as we can see in this image, if we reduce the number, of, uh, reduce the number of turns, then the area won't be mapped that well. But if we increase it, 
drastically, then it may consume a lot of power and a lot of time may be uh, spent scanning a small area. So we need to optimize that. The pattern that we had uh, finalized for our project was Zamboni pattern. So Zamboni pattern actually is um, uh, the pattern that is used for machines to resurface the ice hockey, hockey arenas. So uh, in this figure, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of colored lines. So the AUV will first follow the black line. It will complete its entire circle. Then it will move to the blue line, complete its circle, move to the red line, complete the circle, and then move to the green line. So when we follow the Zamboni pattern, we are uh, doing almost the same thing as a lawnmower pattern. But the great advantage we have is that while moving on the black pattern, it uh, was not able to map the area at the corners efficiently. So uh, when we talk about the landmark pattern, the area at the corners are neglected a bit. But for the Zamboni pattern, when we change our uh, cycle, like when we move from the black to the blue one, the corner that was previously a corner for, a, for the black pattern uh, becomes a straight line for the blue one. So it is taken care in the next uh, go. And that's why uh, when we add uh, this Zamboni pattern, the efficiency at the corners increases and it is uh, op computationally also uh, very much feasible. That's why it is becoming popular uh, now. Now we talk about the control subsystem. So how the navigation subsystem tells the AOV that uh, you need to move forward or backward or turn around is through the thrusters being told to power uh, in a particular direction. So we need to write driver codes to tell the thrusters that what navigation subsystem is telling. So uh, we made a progress and we wrote driver codes uh, for the sensors, but we were quick to realize that our pr prototype is an initial one. And in future, the interns will be working on a uh, much larger depth and uh, there'll be different sensors. So we have also made a documentation to uh, tell the interns that how uh, we can efficiently write driver codes and what sort of prerequisites are required. And we have made the process more streamlined for various sensors so that the inputs on the navigation subsystem uh, go to the thrusters according to their needs. Finally, we have the stimulation of the AV design. So first of all, uh, we got all the uh, dimensions and specification from the mechanical and electrical subsystem, which my uh, co-partner Sharath will be sharing soon. Then we put together the uh, structural part and saw how the design looks like and what changes were to be made. After that, we used a turtle board to stimulate uh, the AOV uh, for the Zamboni pattern. And we saw that how effectively was it covering the search area. Once we found out that it was doing it uh, efficiently, then the uh, search pattern was finalized. The, as I said, that the input dimensions of the stimulated version were kept exactly the same as decided for the mechanical subdivision to ensure the correct validity of the data. Finally, uh, the future work. So, Given the fact that uh, we were making the prototype for the first time, uh, we tried to keep things simple and wanted to make the prototype functional uh, first. So there's a lot of scope of improve. Uh, there's a lot of scope for improvement in this uh, software subsystem, particularly. So I had documented various navigation subsystems, but uh, being the first prototype, we did not wish to use a lot of battery power or consume a lot of power for sen sensors for navigation. That's why we had used a search pattern, but uh, in future, the interns can build up on the uh, documentation that we have created for how uh, good or bad a search pattern uh, or navigation method is, what are the pros and cons that, we'll, uh, that we have researched on. Moreover, uh, we had only worked to uh, made the prototype to work till 20 meters, but uh, we recommend software search system to become more robust so that the AV can go uh, to greater depths uh, because sensors will be uh, provided to it and obstacles uh, would be coming. So uh, obstacle avoidance system also needs to be improved. Finally, we had also uh, made a mission abortion mechanism, but uh, eventually it was discarded, keeping in mind the power consumption uh, priorities. But uh, we recommend it strongly to for the next team because mission abortion uh, ensures that the UV comes back intact in case of some uh, serious environmental uh, challenges like Maybe it is attacked by some marine animal or anything that uh, that is unspeculated. So uh, mission abortion mechanism uh, 
is something that we uh, really recommended. Uh, to end, I would like to say that my intern experience was really enriching and mentally stimulating at MRC. Uh, we had a huge uh, base of knowledge um, at underwater um, awareness and it was a field that I was not exposed to, but under the guidance of some highly qualified MRC members, I got to know a lot of things and I would really recommend most students to associate with MRC team for a great intern experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, so that's a nice speech, guy, and uh, thank you, Harsh, uh, for explaining the software subsystem. So I start my my part from right now. Uh, just let me present my screen. Uh, so I hope uh, you guys can able to see my screen. Can anyone confirm this thing, please? Go ahead, please. Okay, sir. So, uh, me and Harsh are working in the field of uh, uh, autonomous underwater vehicle design and development. So, my name is Boda Sharat Pawan. I'm a third year mechanical guy from IIT Bombay. So, me, me and Harsh are working in the autonomous uh, underwater vehicle in which uh, he he taken his part in software subsystem, while my part is will be in electrical and mechanical subsystem. So I, I will go with the basic plan intro. Uh, so uh, as our works are divided. So for my work, the blueprint will be like, uh, we need to gather the data for the first uh, one month. Uh, we need to gather the data and make the design for the AUV uh, with respect to our needs and uh, gathering the components that which we required for our uh, AUV uh, robot to work and uh, to collect the data from underwater and as well as uh, in the next month, we started uh, simulating those designs and making uh, getting uh, proper uh, results. Where if if there is any kind of uh, design failure, we rectifying that mistakes and doing it again and making different kinds of circuits for our uh, AUV. As this is our first model, so our requirements are very less. So with respect to that, we designed the circuit boards. So at the end of this. Uh, tenure, we started documenting for our future uh, interns who are going to join and may develop more, more in the field of AUV. So let's begin with the mechanical subsystem. So the mechanical subsystem, which I was divided into three parts. One will be the body design and simulation, and the second will be the manufacturing, and third will be the cost explanation. So when coming to the when coming towards the body design and simulations, so there are two different types of uh, body designs in. Uh, in the pre, uh, in the study, so the first one will be the torpedo, and the second one will be the tor non torpedo. So both has their own pros and cons with respect to the usage. So, uh, so the major uh, major amount of people who are presently working in the underwater research domain, they mostly use uh, torpedo shaped UAV because they are very easy and they have less uh, less water drag when compared to the non torpedo thing. So we designed uh, body for the both the uh, both the different kinds of this. Uh, Designs. So the first design, which will be a uh, torpedo shape design, uh, this is a 2D and the 3D diagram. So uh, in this uh, in in this torpedo shape de uh, design, so we are using a yaw motor at the very end of this uh, AUV, where uh, it helps the uh, yaw motor uh, to rotate in left and right direction to make the body to uh, move with respect to the yaw motor rotation. And uh, has a uh, has this yaw motor is uh, it will be more powerful. So we have some strong uh, connections in in the AAV, and uh, we we also use some proper uh, non leakage connectors. Uh, if there is any kind of leakage in the in the body, there will be a lot of issues with the uh, electrical stock and uh, uh, other components. So for that, uh, if in case any kind of water leakage will happen, there will be a system for that. Which will uh, uh, which will detect the uh, which will detect the water inside the body. So it will detect and uh, it shut down all the components in the body and as well as it uh, it supplies some amount of electricity to one particular sub system which uh, which makes uh, a balloon kind of thing around the 
around the AEV makes it float uh, to the surface. So the second design will be the non-torpedo shaped design. Uh, so this is a design uh, which is uh, which is uh, uh, managed by two different ways, like the for the power supply. One will be like wire method, and another will be the battery. So this is a so this is a major hull where the, all the electrical components are placed. And uh, these are the two other portions where the batteries are placed. If you are using a battery based uh, non torpedo shaped AEV, or if you are using a non torpedo shaped AEV with the wide system, it's also be feasible for this particular design. So the so ne next I'm going to explain about the electrical subsystem. So I'm divided this thing into three. Sorry. Can I continue? Please go ahead, please go ahead. Okay, so the so the next subsystem will be the electrical subsystem. So I divide it into three parts again. First row will be the component and circuit design and development. And last will be the coding for the electrical components. Your so, PPT is uh, not uh, visible, Sharath. Sir? Your PPT is not visible. Uh, sir, I shared. Uh, do it you again. Have to you have to share your uh, screen yes. as you were sharing the camera. No, ma'am. Uh, I, I shared come. I started sharing. Okay. Yeah. Now, it it now we now we now it is visible, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do I need to start from the beginning, or it's like fine with where I started, where I left? No. In between, you can start from wherever you are. Now you can start from there only. Okay, sir. So the next subsystem will be the electrical subsystem where uh, it divided into three three divisions again. One will be the component selection for our particular design, and the second will be the circuit design and development, and the third will be the coding for the electrical components. So as we are developing the first mark one with respect to our basic needs, uh, there will be no use of the third uh, part, which is a coding for this particular components in the uh, electrical subsystem so these are the uh, components which i which we are selected for our sub, uh, for our aev so the type 8106 is the hydrophone that which collects the underwater sound noise which was produced by air or water or through uh, through the ships which are roaming around so uh, so we need some particular amount of frequency in which we need to collect the data so for that, uh, we use a DAC system which uh, collects the signal with respect to that particular frequency. And uh, the, uh, the next components we use are like waterproof connectors and motor controllers. And then the IMU and DVL and thruster sides and uh, thrusters and side thrusters. Uh, so this is the data sheet where all the components are, uh, what their costs are, and uh, what kind of model that we are using. So this is a complete circuit design of our present uh, electrical subsystem where we have a, uh, in the power management system, it was linked with the different components like cooling fans and uh, uh, detection of uh, faulty power lines and uh, water seep in detection. And these are all connected the main major power management system and the motion, co uh, motion control are connected to the say, single board computer. And, uh, uh, the power management systems are connected to the battery packs. So uh, uh, let, let me explain the circuit in, in here. So there will be a thruster controller. So uh, there will be like six motors with, uh, with respect to our design. So to control the speed and to control the change of direction. So uh, we use this thruster controller. It will navigate uh, the motors to uh, work with respect to our need. and. Uh, it was connected to the power management module where it will uh, su supply is require a required amount of power to the particular component. So, and uh, other than that, there will be some safety controllers as well, like the temperature sensor and the kill switches and the water seep, uh, water seeping uh, component, which uh, allows the data and uh, saves the component if in case any kind of leakage or any kind of high amount of temperature. So, uh, has a component sheet a lot because of heavy usage in the water. So we use some kind of material called as PCM, uh, which collects the heat and it will convert into a liquid form and it releases into the uh, the heat to the body, which was connected, uh, I mean, the main hull, uh, which is connected to the surface. And it will, it is like a, a tra transferring heat from one body to another. Uh, it, and the heat will be released into the ocean. And uh, this is a major circuit board which we are designed. 
so these are the lights which helps uh, if there is any kind of circuit failure it is uh, with if they are not going it it tells us the circuit is working or not so we are using 96 uh, uh, switches uh, and uh, there there will be like uh, two uh, step down converters and other than after that these are the some other uh, microprocessor which helps the rover to uh, power supply to the particular component so this is the battery management management system where we are using two different batteries one for the one battery will be used for the propulsion which because 90 percentage of amount of power will be supplied to the propulsion system only and uh, second battery will be the for the components so if the first battery was uh, completely discharged so the second battery works uh, starts working there will be a voltage, voltage detect detector uh, which uh, detects if, if if the voltage drops uh, less than 5 volts it will make the first battery high in a series mode so that uh, the power from the first battery transfer to the second and uh, it makes the propulsion system to work uh, under uh, under 5 volts so this is a complete about the electrical subsystem. So uh, the future requirements uh, for the future in, in terms of which they want to further can they can develop it will be like uh, betterment of the electrical circuit, uh, improving in some better uh, component selection if, uh, with respect to the needs. So this is all which I want to present. Thank you. Thank you, Sharad. Harish has joined us from Sri Lanka. I would request if Harish could make his presentation. Harish, can you hear us? Sharad, you need to remove your presentation. Just a sir, just a second. Yes, sir. Harish, please go ahead. Will you share your Yeah, make it full screen, Divya. Yes, sir. I hope now it is full screen. Yeah. Sure. Harish, can, you can go ahead. Okay. A very good evening, uh, panelists, uh, fellow interns, and my dear friends. So I'm Harish Agar. I'm pursuing my uh, final year degree in uh, B.Sc. in Defense Strategic Studies and International Relations, and from uh, Kotalala Defense University, Sri Lanka. So I have been working for around three weeks in MRC. And my topic is Indo-Sri Lankan relations, a new perspective based on the uh, awareness framework. Divya, uh, can you go for the next slide? So as an overview outline, uh, I have categorized uh, my research uh, presentation into a few uh, content. 
uh, outlines which are like overview of my uh, topic, then the geopolitical and geostrategic position of the Indo-Lankan uh, in the Indian Ocean, and then Indo-Lankan relations and how it can uh, further go and UDA underwater under domain underwater domain uh, awareness and then the application and the interventions uh, which are happening and which are need to happen and the last has future direction what's what's the next step that Indo Sri Lankan relation should do so as an overview Sri Lanka is which is a part of Indian subcontinent has a five thousand year old connection with uh, India through the maritime borders. It has a rich maritime legacy which has flourished and impact numerous uh, civilizations throughout the history. So a nation that has been an island can be an unbeatable asset for a in maritime culture. So Due to the Sri Lanka strategic location in the Indian Ocean, the, uh, it is required to have a developed blue uh, economy and other national uh, maritime policies. So the position, the place the, which gives, which provides access to trade routes, international trade routes, uh, marine resources are, ma are mainly benefits around the Sri Lankan coast and it has a wide range of varieties of ecosystems as well. Uh, next. Yo, what the fuck? I don't know. Harish, you can switch off your video, you'll get better connectivity. Am I audible, sir? There's a few connection, I guess. Yes, please go ahead. Now it's fine. Uh, okay. So, India uh, and Sri Lanka are the closest neighbors to each other, and Sri Lanka is a very small nation in terms of in uh, area of India. But its positions on Earth has given it a strategic and uh, geopolitical location as even in Sri Lanka as considered as the pearl of the Indian Ocean. So as Sri Lanka's strategic location in the south of India, it has uh, been the main transport routes in the Indian Ocean which has attracted more western powers and as well Chinese influence as well. Today every nation is building its domain, uh, dominance in the Indian Ocean for trade route. So India also helping to work and to enhance the strategic security by participating in Sri Lanka's strategy. So Sri Lanka's geopolitics has a huge impact on the India's security. Sri Lanka's geopolitics has given importance and has also been India's security point of view. So the elements of geostrategic relations are always mutually exclusive for both the countries. So in geostrategic environment, the relations with our neighbors are naturally very important. So the situation in the neighboring country also affects the country as well. Next one. Next slide. Underwater domain is a very uh, important compound of maritime domain awareness that is specifically focused on the underwater sector. So for the security perspective, this includes sea lines of communication, coastal waters, variety of maritime assets with reference to hostile intent and proliferation of submarine and mine capabilities. So how you underwater domain awareness can help Sri Lanka to upgrade and to advance are to facilitate conservation and development through uh, advanced technologies and to 
by encouraging varieties of economic activities for inclusive growth, such as fisheries, renewable energy, aquaculture, water management, tourism, and even maritime. Sri Lanka has lacked a lot of maritime technologies up to date. Next. So application in interventions in this Indo-Lanka Indo relationships are there are four main interventions uh, and uh, which are also has been an application for the uh, Indo-Lanka thing. Uh, the first one is financial institution has uh, you all know the Sri Lanka being on an economic crisis. It has already taken a huge loan for the country, but financial institutions are very important for investments and more economic uh, uh, investments to uh, build more infrastructures such as recently India has given 40 million dollars of worth of uh, money to uh, build an infrastructure in the northern part to start at a harbor to make the trade route more easier and even uh, next one is which is a technology interventions which has never uh, been changed since 1978 which lacked so many advancements such as Sri Lanka being an island nation has not uh, been uh, taking a considerable uh, engagement in the maritime activities and its resources as well. So the, the third one which is policy intervention. Policy of Sri Lanka towards the maritime uh, uh, and the, its resources has been a huge uh, gap since the 1978. Sri Lanka has not been able to proliferate and uh, comment on maritime policies so far. And the fourth one is internal policies. Has Sri Lanka been a colonized country? Uh, Sri Lanka's uh, internal policies uh, being an island nation has not been uh, up to the standard uh, uh, maritime uh, policies which haven't uh, been uh, regularly changed or adapted and uh, since the 2018 uh, the uh, government have uh, not mainly uh, targeted uh, the maritime uh, policies as, uh, due to the other uh, needs of the government next so future direction how india and sri lanka can work together in the Ma indian ocean region so india being a huge uh, trade partner and economic partner to Sri Lanka can provide a digital ocean to construct Sri Lanka through the UDA framework. So this can happen through tropical little challenges, uh, tropical little environmental challenges and uh, climate change and environmental management uh, through sectors and underwater management through technologies. As we all know, the Sri Lanka government has not updated and advanced this technology in many uh, advanced uh, technological sectors such as for example uh, recently uh, due to the power cuts uh, we, ca we came to know that after the 1948 independence we have not changed the electricity uh, 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 manufacturing way we still use diesel and coal power to uh, power up almost 80 percent of Sri Lanka's technologies so we are lacking a huge uh, back gap in our technology as well and the last one is non-aligned and impractical western solutions this is very uh, much to be highlighted as uh, sri lanka being a colonized and later in an independent country it has implanted with the western solution which are impractical to the current values as being an island nation in the south asia with tradition culture and the way of living more related to the South Asia and Indian continent, the Western solutions are, which are provided by the Western cultures are, were not aligned and uh, can't be practically uh, get into the policies as well as to the country as well. Oh, thank you. I think we are now done with the presentation. Any questions or comments uh, from the audience will be very key. Any advice for our 
interns and even the way we are conducting projects. Rajan sir, uh, any comments from you? <clears throat> and, uh... Yes, sir. Considering that the interns uh, were not exposed to any maritime things, and uh, they have really extremely well in the places and uh, uh, give this presentation on on the noise and uh, vibration see and movies uh, and then finally we have this presentation about indoor Sri Lanka relations and how we can move forward in UAV and what the domain event. It's been a very fruitful uh, day and uh, I really want to congratulate not just the in terms of the work of Nimli but also the who has about the director of MRC who has uh, led the webinars and uh, he's come a long way uh, since he began and he's, and he's an international known figure now in the underworld domain awareness. I don't think there's anyone else in the country who is doing, who is uh, engaged in the underworld domain awareness, which he, which he is. It is an area which was not, which was not uh, taken care of. It was a bit of a state area which, uh, you know, Commander Das has brought it to the fore and it's realized by the powers that be and by the decision makers in Delhi how important it is in the world's main awareness that we should conduct the presentation. Of the sector for the works that we have done. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Daya, sir, would you like to say something? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I must congratulate uh, Dr. Das uh, for organizing uh, this uh, useful interaction, indeed. Um, I mean, just to, I'm not an expert in this uh, area of underwater domain. I represent the Pathfinder Foundation. Um, Pathfinder Foundation and the MR uh, Maritime Research Center in Pune B, uh, you know, to improve, like Harish from KDU mentioned, um, I want to thank him for making this presentation um, we recently uh, to strengthen our ties between the two nations um, especially at the think tank level uh, we entered into a, a certain understanding in MOU uh, exactly the, the with the objective that a number of uh, students who have presented um, undertake research um, because uh, we believe that underwater domain is an area that has not been uh, fully um, the, the benefit uh, through the cooperation, the benefit of which we are not fully exploited. And uh, so we believe strongly our relationship with the MRC would be a first step towards. And I want to thank Dr. Das, especially uh, coming to Sri Lanka and also 
giving this opportunity to a student from the KDU. Uh, I think there will be more and more um, interest from the KDU International and even I. I I I am in in conversation with those in Fias University. So there are a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for us to work together. And I I I, I really benefit from this presentation. As, you know, on covering various aspects of the, this blue economy, uh, you know, which uh, offer a lot of, uh, you know, potential for us to work. So uh, thank you, Dr. Das. Um, all the best. Uh, and I look like, would like to continue uh, from the Pathfinder, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, sir. That was Dayaratna, sir. Doctor Dayaratna, uh, Executive Director of Pathfinder, instrumental in uh, uh, collaboration with MRC. Pathfinder is a very uh, well-known think tank from Sri Lanka, uh, which has collaboration with over forty countries globally, and it is very much involved in significant policy advocacy in Sri Lanka. And we are extremely uh, happy to be their partners in taking forward the underwater domain awareness. So thank you so much, sir. <laughs> and as you said, we definitely will work together to take it forward. Uh, anybody else uh, uh, would like to give any comments? Uh, uh, Kankan, sir, Commander Kankan. Okay, if there are no comments, uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I think I must congratulate uh, the uh, interns uh, and particularly Harish because even in he has just been with us for three weeks and it is a very uh, good effort. And I think it is just a beginning of the Indo Sri Lankan relation. And these kind of interactions have a lot of strategic value in the long term. I mean, India, uh, Sri Lanka at the government to government level, there is a lot happening. Even at the company to company level, there is a lot happening. and. This is our effort of people to people contact uh, <clears throat> and thank you to uh, Pathfinder and also uh, the Kotawala Defense University faculty and the management for having taken uh, this effort in building this bridge. And I think this is just a beginning and there's a lot more that will happen and uh, we look forward to a very close relation. We already have very good uh, interns uh, coming from India, the best uh, of the lot, IIT Bombay, IIT Delhi, and uh, various premier institutions. Uh, unfortunately, there were two more uh, students, uh, two, two more interns who should have presented today, but because of certain personal difficulties, they could not join. Uh, these are history students who are working on riverine archaeology and socio-political uh, issues. So, but uh, we will have another two rounds of such presentations and uh, you will get to see them in the next round. Thank you all so much for joining us. Rajin sir, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, thank, thank you very you, much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.